Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 120. As the host of this show, I get the joy of having these meaningful conversations with my guests and then I get to revisit them a second time when I am editing the episodes. This conversation is with nature journaler Karen Colson, and when I was editing our conversation, I was smiling just as much as I did the first time around. It was an absolute joy to speak with her. Karen has a really interesting story because she came to nature journaling and art after many years of little messages, little whispers that maybe she could be someone who was creative, maybe she could make art too. She talks about connecting the dots, making connections that would finally lead her to dive headfirst into a journaling practice that would become so much a part of her that it's now inseparable from her sense of self. We talk about Karen's hybrid style of journaling, nature journaling as a highly sensitive person, preserving special memories in a travel journal, and a lot more. Let's listen. Karen, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you and listening to your story and how it, how it unfolded. Well, it's just such, I'm kind of pinching myself that I'm having a one-on-one conversation with you <laughs> after I've had moments in time seeing you online in different different settings. And I just, I'm just so thrilled to have a chance to talk with you. Oh, well, I'm really interested in, as I say, the way your story has unfolded and the seeds of both nature and art and how they were planted and grew in your life story. And you shared a little bit of your background with me and it sounds like in your early life that paying attention to nature and your creative self wasn't necessarily fostered but that you had glimpses of things that would eventually become important to you later on. Yeah, there wasn't any malintent. It just happened that the family I was raised in and the place I was raised in, it just creativity and nature both were not on the radar. Mm. Um, You know, they had other things to do and they just different things were focused on. And um, when I hear people tell stories about, oh, my, our family took us Mm -hmm. to the forest every year, but I'm like, oh, wow, that was so (laughs) neat. But um, so, but that being said, I can see little moments um, that I didn't know at the time why, but moments that have stuck in my head, simple moments that don't mean much to anyone else. But I can tell looking back, oh, that was the real me trying to poke its little head out with a little Mm -hmm. voice, trying to say, this is who you are. And it it took until recently in my adulthood till I finally figured out, oh, I get it now. And the more I realized that and followed that, then the more I sort of came into my own self and felt like the true me. Yeah. Do you want to talk about a couple of those things that, that you noticed in your childhood that gave a little spark? A little spark. Yeah. Um, I sort of call them like my connecting the dots. And um, so one thing that I always think of is when I was about five or six, I remember I was sitting outside on the patio at this one house and my grandmother had given me some sort of a paint box because I remember opening the wooden box. And if it was like a Disney film, I just looked inside and it was like magic seeing all these beautiful things. I don't remember now if it was paint or pencils, I don't know what it was, but I remember that moment. And I also remembered, I never played with it. Okay. And that kind of um, crystallizes where there's a push pull in, Mm. in my world in that wow, that made such an impact on me. But all the messages in my world were, you don't touch this stuff, you don't mess it up, you know, you just push it to the side. So I don't even know what happened after that moment. But um, anyway, to me, that was super telling. And um, again, super, um, as I look back, I can see why that was such a moment that stuck in my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another thing that really... um, 
I look back and I, I know it was so important in my growing. And that was, um, I had this aunt in Ohio and every year she would send us a little hand-drawn ink drawing Christmas card. And it could be a house or a branch or a bird or something. And I remember as a kid kind of waiting when the mail would come till that card came and I would pull it out and I would go sit off to the side and I would stare at that thing. And it was simple, an ink drawing. At the time I thought, I never gave it much thought of why was I attracted to it, I just was. And um, I was amazed that someone that I knew could do that. And again, it kind of, that was as far as the thinking went. But I see now that was a major like, ding, ding, this is who you really are, you know? Absolutely. I love that. I love that it was such a treasured moment to, to open that and that that's imprinted on you. And there's been a few other moments like that that you talked about where you saw, for example, some plein air painters and thought, oh, I want to yes. I want to do that. Or that you had a friend, a graphic artist, and you loved her projects in college. So these these moments of looking at other people doing creative things and thinking, that could be me or I want to be that. Yes, I remember whenever I would pass on a beach or a park or a sidewalk, a plein air painter, even though I didn't know what they were called, I remember just gasping and saying, oh, I want to be that person. And again, it's so weird now looking back that my thoughts didn't first like no action was taken until later in my life and um but that happened over and over again and then um i had this friend in college and she was a graphic uh graphic arts some sort of graphic arts um, degree and i remember seeing her projects and thinking oh my gosh that is so neat but i could never do that good for her but that's i don't i can't do that i'm not artistic i don't know anyone who is you know, in my family or in my life. So I'll just admire it from afar. But yeah. Yeah. And you had also this internal um, guide telling you that you had an attraction or um, a fascination with interior design, but also again, that that voice that said, "Mm -mm, that's not me. But then you did follow that, right? Finally, I'm, I guess I'm a, a slow bloomer or something, but <laughs> yeah, I I'll always, and I thought, again, it was just because there was no one around me and no one around me saying, oh, you, you could try that if you wanted. Yeah. Um, and I also didn't voice it, you know, part of it's my responsibility. I would have those feelings and those thoughts, but I never voiced it. I just kept it to myself. And, um, but it was uh, always there. And finally, when I was, I think around late twenties, I finally met someone and, one thing led to another and I was able to sort of apprentice under her and sure enough it turns out I loved it I could do it and I had a knack for it and I it was great so I did it for many many years after that but yeah I I'm slow slow starter I guess (laughs) I love that you've had this voice with you the whole time guiding you in a direction and even before you knew how to listen to that voice that voice was there and to reflect on it in hindsight and think, oh yeah, those messages were there from the beginning. It's very special. Yeah. And I think, you know, if I had some wisdom to pass down to somebody, a young person is listen to that voice, Mm -hmm. those things that make you go, wow, or make you take a second look, or you can't stop thinking about that's how you figure out what you're doing and who you are. Um, And uh, it just, yeah, don't do it my way. It's too hard. Takes too long. (laughs) You missed too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had this little voice about creativity, but you also had glimpses of nature as well or paying attention to nature. And you mentioned a little, a memory, a snapshot of a memory on a road trip, stopping to pass over a bridge. Can you tell this this little story about how yeah, important nature was? It sounds so silly, but um, <laughs> I we were on a road trip with my family when I was you know, I don't know, eight, nine or 10 or something. And we were going to Northern, we always lived in California, we were going to Oregon. And there, you pass a lot of over bridges that have rivers running under them. And in my, in my limited life, I had never seen water running under a bridge. And I impacted me, I made my dad stop. I remember every time we were crossing a bridge, like, you have to stop, you have to stop, we had to get out so I could soak it all in. 
And, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous now, but I mean, it's just, that's just what happened to me, you know? And um, so now I just appreciate it for the fact that, again, it was just that voice getting my attention and, um, you know, till I could pay attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. That That's brought up a memory for me, actually. My dad used to take us out um, fossicking king and canoeing. And I remember he we went on a camping trip or a fishing trip I can't remember but I remember standing on a bridge and seeing the water rush under us and just how powerful and impactful that memory was yeah oh that's neat yeah it's something a glimpse of like the power of nature and just that flow of water is is something really meaningful yeah it's funny too I mean I don't know why but for me water like I love staring into water, even still mm-hmm. water, uh, you know, either kayaking or floating or whatever. I just love it. And I became a scuba diver, I think, because I'm drawn to being underwater and, and seeing water. Um, so, yeah, it, there's something about water in there. <laughs> but yeah, that was a real strong nature connection for me, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And tell me about, so you had these little this little voice gently saying things like there's this other world there's this creative world and I wonder how you stepped into that stepped into the place where you were able to start keeping sketchbooks and um, exploring your creativity how did that happen well I think it was um, a time in my life where I had a very significant loss and so I was kind of broken open you might say and also i had reached a certain level of maturity and i was in my 50s so um i think the timing just finally happened yeah and i i somehow i don't remember exactly how stumbled on sketchbook school which Mm -hmm. had just started back then and i went wait what's this and i from i really from that first moment on i it's been like Pandora's box was open for me and I've never looked back and it's become my obsession and my, my identity really. Um, so that was about 2014 or 15, I think. Um, and yeah, that's how it started. And it was more just kind of like the universe finally said, (laughs) you're going to get this message one way or the other. (laughs) (laughs) Did you take the first, were you in the first cohort for beginnings in sketchbook school? I was. That's amazing. I was there too. <laughs> I'm from. Oh, that's so cool. Yes. yes that was it. So, f- so for listeners who aren't sure what we're talking about, Sketchbook School is a, an online school. Started off in 2014, I think, uh, with Danny Gregory and Kosha Kuna. And they had a whole range of different artists talking about beginnings the theme was beginnings and it was such a wonderful way just to crack open a sketchbook Danny Gregory's um, whole thing is about starting and being imperfect and getting rid of the inner critic and just uh, sketchbooking your life essentially so we we did um, do you remember the exercise with um, sketching as you ate eat an apple so we started yes. by sketching uh <laughs> A whole apple and then take a bite, sketch again, take a bite, sketch again until you're sketching the apple core. Um, Wonderful exercises like this to break open your creativity and just put it there on the page. Um, It's exciting to know that you that we were there in the same class. Yes, (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I suppose I would have run into this whole sketchbooking world at some later point, but whatever. I'm just glad it happened when it did. And then, um, you know, one thing just leads to another thing. And Mm. then there's the nature journaling club. I mean, and then it's all pretty soon. It's just all overlapping and it's just great. Yeah. 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 So you describe yourself as having a hybrid nature journaling style. And I guess that Mm -hmm. pulls in influences from the sketchbooking world, from the urban sketches. Tell me about this hybrid style that you, that you have. Well, yeah, I, sometimes there's, especially when you're with like the pure nature journalers, the science driven ones that are all about the metadata and they're, you know, fantastic. And that's incredible. I don't fit in that niche, just me. Um, My attraction to it is more like, I don't want to box around what I want to draw. Yeah. If I want to draw a shoe or if I want to draw a mountain or if I want to draw a flower, 
I just draw what is making me feel something. And um, so I don't put labels on it. And I also don't get too much in metadata or I do write a lot in my book, but it's more experiential. So it's more, if I'm on a trip, it'll be, you know, describing what it felt like in that moment to be drawing that bird that I saw or whatever it might be. Um, but as opposed to facts and researching species and Latin names and all that stuff, I just, mm -hmm. I, that's just not what draws me in. So there's a discussion, you know, there's kind of a push pull in the nature journaling world oh, yeah. of the science ones versus what are kind of classified as the pretty page ones, mm -hmm. two different schools of thought. And I just want to be universal and all encompassing. My philosophy is everyone who wants to do it, however they want to do it, should not feel that they aren't welcome to do it. Um, and they can call it whatever they want. I just don't care about the labels. This is creativity. There, you know, in my mind, there shouldn't be labels. So that's where I fall on that on that debate. <laughs> yeah, I one hundred percent agree with you. I, it's interesting. I think that there's these different ideas of how to do it, and maybe each one is looking at the other, thinking, "Oh, if only I could reach that level of." Of skill or that level of pretty right. page or 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 design or layout I often my my pages very start off very organically I just put down what uh what interests me and then I just go out and out and it, they end up being incredibly messy and so I look at other people who have beautifully laid out pages and I think oh I should be doing it like that I think that there's this whole like you say a push pull um but I 100% agree and I think that there's no valid, there's no rules, there's no this, this is nature journaling or this isn't. I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. I think it should be. Oh, good. I'm glad. I think it should be whatever, whatever. <laughs> it, it's coming into my mind. My, my, uh, my son's uh, paternal grandmother always says, whatever blows your hair back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <And> I, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I think that's what it should be. It should be whatever ignites joy inside you because that's what it's all about right and I love right. something that you said which was I just draw what's making me feel something and anyone who knows me will know that I'm all about feelings and I'd love to talk to you about that um because you say that your pages are something that's spoken to you something that's brought you into the present moment or even uh the process of processing difficult emotions you said that um, it could be a place for exploring grief or personal growth or something like that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on all that feeling stuff in your nature journal. Yeah, for me, I, um, I've learned as I've started to analyze now that I've been doing it a while, um, whether it's on the, you know, on the spectrum of full joy or full grief, mm -hmm. let's say, and everything in between, um, when I'm working on my sketchbook, I can process all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I can make happy memories deeper and more, I get more into gratitude and more into like pinch me. I can't believe, you know, really present in the moment. Um, and then on the trauma or grief side, it's a great tool. I've mm -hmm. used it for all kinds of things, illness, injury, death, whatever um, things to help process it and understand it and realize that no matter how bad there always ends up being a gift in everything. And it's a great, for me, it's been a great tool to get to find out how, through it, bad things, and then to find out what is the, what is the gift in this? What is, why did I go through this? You know? So um, it really is, I don't know, like, again, I don't even know who I'd be without it now. It's just such a part of my entire life, you know. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? That it's become a part of you, a tool for processing or the whole spectrum of life's ups and downs. And uh, I often talk about the head and the heart of nature journaling and where where people sit in that. And it sounds like you sit squarely in the heart center <laughs> I'm so far in the heart I, in my notes I sent to you um I'm I realize that um that I like to add words to my pages uh after I'm done almost always mm -hmm. after I'm done 
and I'm so in whatever space I get into when I'm deep into it that I can't even write a simple sentence. I can't spell. I can't form a thought. I literally have to get up, take some space, sort of shut off that one side of the brain and go back to the other yeah. side. There's no crossover for me. And so it's, it's weird because I, it's, it's so total. Like, I mean, I've lost verbal skills when I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking maybe that's why I don't do so much of the science. Maybe that's why that doesn't attract me because it's two separate parts of my brain mm. and they don't seem to communicate with each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. And I've usually, even after I've taken time and figured out what I want to write and write it, I still misspell. And so I decided to make it my trademark. I don't think I have one page without misspelled words on it. So I've decided I that's it. my trademark. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. Oh, well, I, I, I'm going, I'm going to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just got to accept it. I, I couldn't fight it. So just accept it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And maybe this, what you've just described comes along with being a, a highly sensitive person and, I'd love to hear your thoughts on be, on what they call an HSP, which I am definitely as well. And it mm -hmm. comes, it, being highly sensitive comes with the ups and the the highs and the lows, the peaks and the troughs of life. And I think that it's, it's definitely not a trait that I would trade. It's something I really love, but it's hard, right? Do you want to talk right. about being a highly sensitive person in a world that's not designed for us? <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. Well, when I learned what it was, it made me, uh, it was a giant step forward in sort of understanding my place in the world. So I was very yeah. happy to gain that understanding. But um, obviously the negative is I I can't do crowds for very long. I don't mm -hmm. like cities. You know, I just, I definitely need quiet and space and calm, which is obviously very aligned with sketchbooking. So those two things go together great. But then on the other, the upside of being an HSP is you're noticing so much more when you're in these quiet spaces. Yes. If I walk with a friend who's main, I don't think is an HSP, I can just tell maybe, um, mm -hmm. invariably after, if you, if I walk with them a lot, I'll go, I can't believe all the stuff you see and hear. Yeah. And I just goes, and they're white beside me and they don't. And I go, oh, it's just, you know, I just kind of trained myself to do it, but I know it's why. I, it's like um, the downside is you're always hyper vigilant, but if you use that to your advantage when you're out in nature, then you get to really see as much as you can and hear as much as you can and sort of pick up things that other people might miss. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes I'm out in nature and just this, the most simple thing will hit me as incredibly profound and, and I'm able just to stand in nature and cry for seemingly no reason, but really it is just that connection, that feeling like, oh, what is going on here? We're on this planet and all these organisms around me. And that feeling of being connected to nature in that way is, is highly emotional for me, but it's confusing for people who don't have that same I know. I, sensitivity. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, I don't know, that's a gift. I mean, I think I'm very happy that we have that trait because yeah. even though it's, hard sometimes it's so worth it to be that present and to have those rich moments where you go oh I'm so happy to be alive in this second so those are good times yeah, absolutely and it sounds like COVID lockdown for you had a big impact and as a as a highly sensitive person maybe this sort of retreat into our own worlds suited you or or but or but it sounds like it made you reflect on a whole bunch of things including you know what it is to be human and our connection with nature. And I'd love to hear about your experience of the lockdown and how that impacted and changed you. I remember when the lockdown started and people, you know, were emailing and whatever, just you were learning how people were experiencing it. And sure enough, the people that were much more social and they, I, I could, I could hear by what they were saying online and, you know, emails or whatever, or phone calls that they were struggling so much more than I was. And I realized um, I had a lot more tolerance for a lot of alone time than a lot of mm. more social people do. Um, and so I felt bad because there was nothing 
they could do about it. And I was sitting here happy as a clam painting leaves in my backyard, you know, so I didn't care too much. I mean, I didn't want to get sick and I didn't want anyone to have yeah. issues. And obviously I was worried about the world, but um, just in a daily thing, I was okay with it. And then, um, and then I noticed when, after the immediate lockdown was, and we were allowed to start going out on trails or the beach or whatever, but before really, you know, cars were still off the roads, businesses were closed. Um, I was so amazed at how quickly nature returned and mm. came in closer, birds especially, but really all things. And I, and I, it was just because there was less human getting them away, you know, and um, man, I really loved that period because I was one of the few out there and I was just having all these great interactions with creatures that I don't normally get to interact very closely with. And, um, and, and then I, I also, I kind of felt like I should apologize as a human to every creature that I encountered because it was really um, a very real feeling of how much negative humans are to the world. And because um, in such a short time, everything started bouncing back. And, you know, what if we were out of the world for a year? Can you imagine the bounce back for the animals and the birds yeah. and all the creatures if, if human impact wasn't around for a year? But anyway, so that was just kind of, again, kind of seeing our place in the world and reevaluating relationships and what you want to do with your life because we don't know what's coming around the corner next and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I love that that sense that witnessing something or or putting it down in your in your journal is is honoring that creature or or plant or animal whatever it is. Um and it, I got the sense of that for you like that in that that sense of feeling guilt about being human or needing to apologize to this beautiful world that we for what we've been doing that there was a sense of honoring or um witnessing by by journaling that that's a powerful thing I think yeah it's true and I think again it goes back to when I am nature journaling it so connects me to things like gratitude and appreciation Mm. and um you know if it's like what's that saying that John Murla- Muir's laws has um, sustained compassionate mm-hmm. attention is love something mm-hmm. to that effect. Yes. Um, that's that crystallized thought right there. That is, yes. that is nature journaling and that is all kinds of, as far as I'm concerned, um, journaling, but um, yeah, that's, that's where you really feel part of the whole system. And that's where you feel kind of bad about being a human. <laughs> At least I did. But you can, you know, I do agree that um, when you pay attention to something, it changes the relationship, um, at least in my, you know, maybe that bird didn't know that we have a new relationship, but I do. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know, um, there's a scientist who's also a rock star, his name's Brian Cox, and he he said this thing once, and it's all about um, physics, and I don't understand it, but... um, he said, if you make any sort of movement or any, if you just by existing, you are interacting with and affecting like every atom of everything that exists is interrelated. And I don't understand how that's possible, but if he says it, I, I'm going to believe it. And it, it's uh, something about yeah. that. It makes, it makes me feel like entirely connected. And so when you say maybe the bird doesn't know, but I think there's something there. Maybe there is the a bird connection. does know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the cells of the bird knows in some way. <laughs> yeah. I always try to speak to animals, I, you know, like Dr. Doolittle would, but it just mentally telepathy wise, um, yeah. especially when I'm scuba diving, because when you're scuba diving, there's nobody talking. All you hear is mm. your breath mm. and bubbles. And so it's a very serene thing to do and so when you have encounters with especially like sea turtles or bigger creatures i definitely try to send them as many messages as i can and get my energy in a space where i'm trying to tell them i love them Uh, you know i just want them to have a great life and thank you for letting me see you and be with you for these minutes and you know i do a lot of that underwater stuff or, or on land but um you know, hopefully, hopefully it got through. (laughs) Oh, that gives me goosebumps. I love that so much. I think that our intention as we move through the world is, is so important. 
And if you're giving out these feelings of love and connection and goodwill and wanting the world to be happy and safe and calm, that that does mm-hmm. something, I think. And it changes the way certainly you interact with other people and um, the way you feel inside. I'm all, I'm all for that. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> um, and so along with the COVID lockdown came this whole opening up of another world, which was the Zoom world and all the different um, connections that we've made with other teachers and with other people and communities across the world. And, I mean, this this chat we're having right now has become a reality because of the technology that we now use um, I'd love to hear your experience of just that that opening up of teachers and learnings and communities and friends across across the world since then. Well, that was um, again as one of most of COVID was bad, but one of the good things was <laughs> this, and that is um, so much content started being online and people from all over the world could see what other people are doing and share time with them. And just even if you had an hour with someone, even if it's online, it's better than just in your own head the whole day when, you know, no one's talking to anybody in COVID. And um, I think it was such a neat thing that if we had to go through COVID, at least we had the technology to make it more enjoyable, so to speak. Um, But yeah, so those relationships now that the world's opened up, I've started one by one, little by little, and just when it when I can pull it together, actually, you know, when the situation's right to actually meet some of these people in person. Yes. And it's just so fun because like with you, I already feel like I know you. And after today, yes. I feel like I know you even more. So if I saw you on the street, we're already old friends. Yes. Um, but to be able to travel again, um, I know you know Jules Wolford. Mm-hmm. And um, we had a, I had a trip planned to an area near her that was had to get canceled because of COVID. So we were speaking and we had it all planned and we were going to spend a day sketching together. So that's still on my to-do list. Yes. I got to get over there and see her. But um, yeah, stuff like that. So that's that's been fun. And, and now making these online relationships, you know, real. And I'm hoping um, Wild Wonder, I did the first Wild Wonder when it before COVID, when it was in person. In person. And mm-hmm. it was... I mean, I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to sleep. I barely (laughs) went to the restroom. I just wanted to get every second. It was such a rich experience. And I've loved, I've loved the wild wonders online and thank goodness we didn't lose it all together. But I'm hoping Mm -hmm. that at some point there's at least many wild wonders because there's something about being with the people um, in person. You just, it's, it's still, you can't, you can't get that hundred percent through the computer. Yes, you're right. And there's an, there's a teacher who lives on the East Coast um, who's been very important, significant to you. And I guess Zoom has opened that up. And that's Jean McKay. Yes. And I finally got to go to two places and take classes from her in person. Oh, wow. And she's Tell me about that. one of, yeah, so she's um, for years, I've, I've got a Pinterest board with all these things pinned, you know, and she was very prominent on there. And you know, who knew that I would ever get to meet her one day. But um, anyway, she teaches at um, um, Hog Island Audubon Camp yes. in off of Maine. And so I did that. COVID was kind of still going, but winding down. So it was the first time they'd had it since COVID was ending. And I got to go to that one. And, um, you know, after you've admired someone's work to be, and even though I've taken classes from her online, to be able to sit next to them at a table yes. and see their hand making marks on a page and hear their thoughts as they're doing it. It's just pinch me, you know, yeah. it's just fantastic. And then to have a meal and just talk about life. And so I got to do that, it was awesome. And then um, last year in in May, I got to go to Italy and she was teaching um, for, a, for Winslow Art Center over in um, Umbria. And we got to stay in a castle for a week what with come on that's ev- amazing everybody <laughs> doing sketching all day and in a castle I mean really it was the best so it was it's just the best yeah so I love that stuff that's my that's where I am right now is just I'm luckily in a age and a time in my life when I can do that so before I'm too old I'm still trying to travel and see these places and these people before I can't do it anymore you know yeah, well, let's talk about that because I love how you travel and journal and that the, that a travel journal can become like a friend. You mentioned that, you know, if you travel alone, the journal can be your 
your go-to safe place or your place to explore and to interact. And I'd love for you to talk to me about your travel memories and how the journal has has been able to be a place to savor and capture those memories. So um, often what I'll do is, I'll, if I'm going someplace far away like Europe or something, I'll, I'll book a class that's set. So I have some time with people and having the social as well as the classes and just that whole experience. But I'll tag on some days before or after and travel by myself somewhere near mm -hmm. there before I come all the way back home. And so I end up traveling a lot by myself and also on the way over there and by myself on the plane and the way back and stuff. So um, when I was first doing it, I felt like, like sitting at a restaurant alone was just so awkward and oh, it was, I couldn't do it. But anyway, I've gotten very used to that and now it <laughs> doesn't even phase me. Now I absolutely love it. So, you know, I'll roam around a foreign city or go hiking on a mountain where there's just, you know, trail signs marked on rocks and just follow that. And, you know, it, it's just, I just love that unknown and not knowing what I'm going to do that day and bringing my sketchbook and just seeing what happens, like not planned. I really love that kind of just go with the flow stuff. Yeah. And do you feel like when you look back on your journals later that those memories then spring up into life really vividly for you? Oh, yes. And it's where I'm, you know, I was, when I look back at those, when I see the words I've written, not even, you know, the artwork is whatever it is, but I mean, even when I see the words that I want put down to accompany it, it's next level in terms of how it's expressing how I truly felt. And for me, I really have to be fully in that moment to get to that place where I can extract those words out of me eventually, you know? So um, yeah, they're very meaningful, very meaningful chapters in my life. And I, mm. I, hope I don't have to, you know, I hope I can keep doing it for a long time because it's really kind of at this phase of my life, what I'm, what I'm doing. Mm, yeah. I love hearing you speaking. It, it just comes across. It just comes out that, that you and sketchbook, keeping a sketchbook are one and the same, you know, that's just a part of your personality. It's just a part of you, a part of your life. And just in the same way as it might be someone who exercises or or whatever it is that's that's just your thing it keeps me balanced um I, you know sometimes if i'm ill or tired or you know been doing too much i i realize i don't have any creative drive for a few days and when that's in the early days when that would happen i would go oh my god is it gone did it go away am i you know and that but now i realize it's telling me reset rebalance because it's a sign to me that I've I'm doing something's out of whack if I'm not feeling creative um so it's a real good barometer on keeping mm. myself healthy emotionally and physically yeah yeah that the that that feeling is so so much a part of you that you, you can use it as a gauge like are things in balance are things going the way they need to and if not you can bring more quality time with yourself or you can rest more or whatever it is that you need to become balanced to to let the creativity spark again I love that yeah and, and you, also, also having the trust that it will come back you know yeah. that's the thing I've learned over time is that it you know now I know use it for the information that it's giving you but don't panic the creativity is going to come back and you'll be fine you know yeah so it's it's good that way too I, I think that we have to forgive ourselves sometimes, hey, because, you know, like we have this idea like we've got to be going full steam ahead all the time. And I find that myself with my own creativity, some days, sometimes or some periods, it's just flowing. It's great. And it yeah. feels like it's it's connecting me with this very important part of myself. And then other times, oh, gosh you have to sort of drag it out and then <laughs> and then there can be some level of like self talk that says oh you know you've lost it or it's not coming back or whatever i think we i think we do have to acknowledge those ebbs and flows of creativity and that that that's completely fine and part of it yeah and that on the days when it's you feel it's not there don't try to force it to be there because it won't be a fun experience and you're just making yourself yeah. more stressed out. Just be okay mm -hmm. that you're not going to draw that day. Um, yeah. It's funny. I, something that was earlier that you were talking about, I wanted to throw in there was 
um, people that that I, are friends that don't have anything to do with the sketchbook world at all. They often, you know, if they see my sketchbook or something, they'll want to see it. And then they'll say, well, what do you do with it now? And I say, well, I just close it. And when it's done and I put it on the shelf and get a new one and do it again. Wait, what? What do you mean? What do you know? But what are you going to do with it? I go, yeah, it's done. It, what I'm doing with it is the day I was doing that. That was the doing. The rest is just extra paper. You know what I mean? So it's the experience that is yeah. the thing. And it's so funny to try to explain to people that don't do this because they're like, but, but no, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Aren't you going to frame it? What are you going to do with it? <laughs> Put it yeah, on the that is that is such an interesting thing. And that just highlights the importance of the process instead of the product and just yep. how how much this, this is a, an internal thing. It is for us. Who cares about what it looks like? And sometimes you'll make a page that really pleases you and that you yeah. want to look at again and sometimes not. And it, yeah. yes or no, it doesn't matter at all, does it? Because you, like you say, the, the process is what's important. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And going back to the whole idea of sketchbook school, you know, on those days that, uh, that just not feeling it, but also maybe you want to do something, it's okay to sketch your feet or your shoes or your <laughs> or a dead bug on the windowsill whatever it is it doesn't have to be a masterpiece you don't have to plan yeah. a page you can just move a pen around on the paper yeah and it doesn't have to be like some magnificent experience in your life which is great <laughs> but it like you said it can be a bug that's just as just as worthy of a of time spent i've been trying to teach myself a little bit how to draw people lately yes. because that was I always call it like the last frontier to me that's mm -hmm. <laughs> I just got no skills at that at all um yeah. and so I'm like okay quit complaining about it start doing it because I just want to be able to throw in a person or two not a portrait but just like in a cafe yep. scene or something mm -hmm. just for context Anyway, making a little progress on that, but still got a ways to go. <laughs> I'm totally with you. And that's been on my list of things to tackle because, um, I, I, you know, we were talking before about how uh, sometimes we're able to look at other people's pages and think how they differ from ours and the things I'd like to be able to do that others are doing. And one of them is putting people in the journal. I love it. I love seeing people. Um, John Muir Laws does this amazingly well. And um, a nature journaler called Amaya Shreve, she does this so well. She does these beautiful cartoons of herself in yes, the situation. Puts herself I, in the scene. Yep. Yeah. And I'd love yeah. to be able to do this. And I have all this like self-talk and self-criticism whenever I, attempt to do it oh don't mess up the page by doing that even though right? I really want to <laughs> so that's one of my I like that you called it the frontier it's like okay you gotta step up and learn this thing and I really love and I want to practice um you know very traditional watercolor paintings where they do put people in but really they're just sort of smudges of color and yeah. they turn out to be figures I love that yeah. style and I want to learn that Yes, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos, which are, um, you know, people that are showing you how to do in a few gestures to get that. Because I, I don't have any aspirations, like I said, to be a portrait painter or be able to capture someone's actual face or something. I just mm -hmm. want them to know that's a human and it's not a, yes. some kind of weird bug sitting on the page. So. <laughs> <laughs> So we talked about COVID and about being separate. Um, and you mm -hmm. mentioned a little bit about what happened when the world opened up again and you started going to real life classes and um, you are living in a place where the nature journal community is quite rich and um, you've had some, some experiences of nature journaling with others. And I'd love to hear your, um, your experience of nature journaling with others in community and, or maybe just in pairs, but just that experience of journaling it with other people. So we have in, I'm in San Diego in California, and um, we have a little group that's called North County Sketchers. And we meet every other Friday, most of the time. And we'll pick, like, sometimes it'll be more of an urban sketching thing. And sometimes mm -hmm. it'll be more of a nature thing. But on a given day, let's say you're going to a place where it's buildings, there's always plants. So someone mm -hmm. can still 
put a nature spin on it if they want to, or, you know, vice versa. So again, we, we just, we didn't call ourselves urban sketchers or nature journalers because everyone just wants to be together, learn from each other. You know, it's always like, oh, what's, what's that paintbrush? What pigment is that? You know, and which is so fun. And, you know, you're thinking if I just had that right paintbrush, I'd be a master, but before, that's <laughs> not true. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the really fun part of sharing time and then seeing, you know, people basically in the same place at the end, you see, and it's everyone's so different and yet everyone has so much to offer in their point of view of it. Um, that's the fun part of that. So we've been doing pretty good on our little group. And then, um, I have some sketcher friends that live other places in the country that when we're, when we can visit each other, that's what we do when we're together. Um, so that's fun. So yeah, I, I do. Um, I do like when you do find like-minded people that mm. share that it, it gives you such a common ground. That's what was so great about wild wonder. You have all these people with all these backgrounds and all these different approaches, but one thing they all had in common, they wanted a nature journal. So it was just such a great community to be with and learn from and just be the energy of it was fun. I find it quite amazing that you can be journaling the same thing as somebody else, but when you lay out your pages, what you've put down is completely entirely different. And I love that yeah. difference in perspective. And it's so fun. I think the the situation where the the part of the journaling meetup where you share your page um, is so valuable, and just that gleaning of ideas from other people it's quite it's quite a big deal, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And, you know, everyone's always so kind and um, generous. You know, it's, I think people that maybe aren't in this worry that people are critical, like some mean teacher that you might have had in school or something. <laughs> and that's just, I've never experienced that ever, uh, you know, with anybody. Everyone's very encouraging and willing to share and also willing to point out what they think you did great, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned this thing that I think is really wonderful that that spark that ignites when you when you see someone discover nature journaling for the first time oh, yeah. I'd love for you to speak about that that watching someone else blossom in their nature journaling oh I have two really specific quick little stories about that um one in, in that nature journaling group that we have here um one of the gals was just coming to it as an artist and just as a sort of urban sketcher and I guess I just in conversation said the word nature journaling, and I tend to lean towards more naturey stuff mm. wherever we are. And she's like, wait, nature journaling, what's that? And I, even though she was kind of already on the edge of doing it, she hadn't mm -hmm. heard the word. Mm -hmm. And so um, we had a gift exchange at Christmas and um, we had a little potluck and then everyone was to bring their extra art supplies that they don't use. And then we could just pick from the table, whatever we wanted. So what I brought was I had an extra one of the John Muir Laws sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. um, and so she happened to be the one that got that. And it's the nature journal thing. Well, yes. she is on fire now. She's just, <laughs> oh, oh, I my can't goodness. wait. And every time I see her, she goes, look what I did. And um, she's, of course, now gone online and seen a lot more stuff. And so her eyes are like, Whew you know, yes. and um, she's, she's really having a good time with with her new passion. Um, <laughs> and then another time I was, I was hiking, I was on top, I was gone pretty far, it was a big hike on some rocks. So it was very dangerous. And my goal was to get to a lake that was on top and nature journal up there. So I got up there, I did my nature journaling, and then the sun was starting to set. And then I realized, oh my God, I've got to go down this same rocky slope. It's <laughs> going to be very dangerous. And what have I done? I was so single focused on getting there. And I thought, oh God, I might be in trouble up here. And um, this couple was standing next to me and they were just starting down. And I said, would you mind if we kind of walk together? Because I'm a little unsure about the rocky terrain. And it turns out they're a photographer and a nature like... Um, a birder super birder oh wow um, and anyway so they said what were you doing up there and I said oh I was nature journaling and so they, they said when we get to the bottom and we're on flat ground will you show us your book so I we got down I pulled it out of my backpack I opened it up and she went that's what I want to do just oh, like wow. I'll never forget it and we became good friends <laughs> that's we, amazing. we've been friends ever since but um <laughs> she's like 
that's what I want to do just like that. And so I sent her a list of all the things she just, these things she needs to buy a water brush, a sketchbook, yeah. some watercolor paints, and, you know, and I'm off and running. She goes. And so those are two really crystal clear moments where I saw boom, that light bulb go off and oh my gosh, so fun to see that happen. That lights me up. I love those stories. And I've had that experience myself, like when I'm giving a nature journal workshop to some people who haven't, maybe haven't done it before, but I, I remember sitting with this participant and she, she was so focused and she said, and I said, what are you seeing? And she said, look at this, how the light is ca- catching on this brown, the part. It, it, it just was totally like to the, to another person would be a, a part of the plant that was totally uninspiring. But she was just right. like, look at this dried up brown part and how the light's catching on. I was like, yes, you, can. <laughs> <laughs> you see things differently when you look through a nature journal lens and you see yes. beauty everywhere. And that when people are captivated by something that would ordinarily seem uninspiring, I just know they've got it. They've got that nature journal. Thing yeah. You know, them. you found one, one of the <laughs> posses in there. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, a couple times, like in random places and, you know, far away places, I'll come across someone. I'll, one time I was on a, on an Island and I was taking a hike and I, came into this open field and I saw a person sitting on the ground and I saw their head going up and down like this and something mm-hmm. and they're looking at their lap. And I'm like, Oh my God, I think that person is, nat- is nature journaling. <laughs> so I run over there. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. I, I just, I, are you nature journaling? She goes, yeah. And she holds oh, up wow. her book. Turns out I knew her from her name anyway, from yeah. the nature journal club. And wow. she was also on a boat and also moored there and had come up, come and she did. And I'm like, oh my God. So when I have one of those moments, it's called um, finding a nature journal in the wild. So <laughs> someone that you yes. run across. And I, I'm just, when that happens, it's just the best. I'm like, oh, I found one of my people. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. How wonderful. What an amazing experience. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned about words rather than facts and figures and numbers and metadata being your thing but words and poems and quotes and things that are moving in a conceptual way from you know through the heart I mean um tell me about that about being inspired by words and poems so I um my favorite poet is a woman named Victoria Erickson and she has two books that I know of anyway. And um, one is called Rhythms and Roads. And the other one is called Edge of Wonder. And there's something about how she writes that really connects with me. So sometimes um, when I'm working on a page and I'm finishing and I can't quite figure out what I want to put on there about maybe the experience that I've just had, I'll open Mm -hmm. that book Mm -hmm. And I'll look through and then I'll go, oh, that's the poem that needs to go on this page. Um, Because it really, some of them are just a few lines long. And um, she has this one, I marked it because I thought I wanted to tell you. It's called, it's, they don't have names for poems. They're just poems. Okay. Um, In order to sort out the chaos, complications and confusions, we must come back to the simplest thing we do know. What feels like nourishment? Begin with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That hits that's deeply. how she speaks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, in a way, that's kind of like why I nature journal. Why does yeah. it feel nourishing? Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah. And so I also have a, I keep a Pinterest board of mm-hmm. other quotes that I find or that I might hear from someone else. And um, I sort of have them in categories of, you know, beach or nature or mm-hmm. whatever you might need. And um, sometimes I'll sift through those and find something that seems right and fitting for the moment. Isn't it a powerful experience when you read the words of someone else and they hit you so deeply because there's this sense like, oh, yes, someone's just distilled my own thoughts or feelings into a few words. There's such a powerful thing. And said it in such a clear way. It's like crystallizes that feeling. And I I do love that. I think that's why, um, you know, when certain and lyrics in songs sometimes I'll do. I really love listening to music while I'm painting Mm. and um or I'm, I, when I walk, I always listen to music. And sometimes mm-hmm. when I'm walking, the lyrics of a song will 
now tell me what I'm going to be painting later that day. And those lyrics will go on the page. So it's yeah. kind of all connected, but you never know where inspiration is going to come from. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just so, I just feel really happy. I, I have enjoyed this conversation so much. And I love that. I love the story because there were all these points of light along your path that sort of were guiding you. And, um, you talked about an Oprah quote where she sort of said, um, the world will give you these little whispers. And if you don't listen, do you want to say, do you remember how to yeah, articulate it's something that? Like, um, yeah. She says, um, first the universe will tap you on the shoulder. <laughs> then it will whisper in your ear. Then it, something like, you know, just keep, and then it'll shout and then it'll drop a house on your head. Don't <laughs> yes. wait till it drops a house on your head. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. that's a, a good philosophy throughout all aspects of life, but, um, but I, that really applies to, to my life and um, that, you know, it's, the messages are always there. And I've learned that the more I listen and tune in and live by those, the more they come. So mm. it's like a faucet being turned on mm. and um, it's kind of magical, actually. It feels very like magic. So when I'm really living the way I want to live and being true to myself, listening and being in alignment with myself, things start happening. Messages mm. from the, I mean, this sounds wooey gooey, but I mean, you know, it's just like signposts are there animals come. I mean, it's just really kind of a magic thing. And, um, you know, I can't make it happen. I only notice it when it does happen. I can't like force it. Um, but yeah, I think it's a real thing for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you've been influenced by, um, uh, big magic by Elizabeth Gill, but I love this. Book yes. Too. Do you want to talk oh, about I, that? It's my favorite book. I hope I don't slaughter the meaning, but, um, <laughs> for me, the way I interpret it was that she was saying that, the big magic is that um, creativity, kind of like what I was just saying, it's floating all around us. Mm -hmm. And you have to be first open and ready to receive it um, mm -hmm. in order for it to pick you. Otherwise, it goes on to the next person. And um, almost as it's a creature unto itself. And, yes. it, and because I've experienced it myself, um, it just a lot. I mean, I think that's the truth. For me, it's the truth. And so, um, it's again, it's back to feeling very magical when you can connect and feel that alignment and um, feel the universe is in support of your choices. Um, because, you know, that's, that's, I think why we're all here trying to figure out yeah. how we're supposed to do each of our own paths, you know. Absolutely. I love that you've come to be living in alignment with your true self now, expressing your creativity, being close to nature and letting, letting that guide you in the direction that feels good that is good that's healthy and and bringing yeah bringing all these important things into your life together yeah thanks I think you know I think a lot of culture especially western culture is about you know sacrifice and work and you know which are yes those things are important but not giving enough credit to being conscious, trying to be conscious and how you want to live your life and um, the, the great rewards you get when you do pay attention. Absolutely. Karen, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, thanks for having me. I really, you made it easy. Thank you. I loved our chat. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Karen. It made me smile when I was editing because I had forgotten that we talked about putting people in our journals, which is really good timing for our nature journal prompt that we're working on right now from last week's episode. There were so many things that I loved about this conversation, but it really stood out to me when Karen talked about her creativity as a barometer of how things are going in her wider life and how something being off with her creativity might be a sign that she needs more balance in other areas. I also really enjoyed Karen's message that when we hear these little whispers from somewhere inside us, we will do well to listen to them. For Karen, it opened up something momentous that changed her life entirely and for the better. Karen wrote a piece for the International Nature Journaling Week blog and if you go to the show notes for this episode, you'll find a link to that article. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Mm -hmm.